the Together Talks podcast. Today we're here in Wellingborough where Ben Habib is standing. We're going to be talking to Ben. Uh, we're going to be going to the hustings that's with BBC Northampton with all of the candidates that are standing here. We're going to be encouraging you to ask the questions around freedom, around net zero and a pledge uh, and around issues around liberties and privacy that you've got, we've got it together and see who the best candidate is. We're going to be talking to Ben Habib. I personally am very impressed with him, but let's hear what he's got to say. We're going to see him out on the street canvassing. Uh, we're hearing all sorts of things about who's on the street here, who's not, who's worried, who's not. But we won't know till 15th of February what the outcome is. So uh, we're also going to be here for the next couple of weeks. You'll see some exciting things that Together's going to do as well. But we want you all to get involved, to have a vote for who you think is the most freedom-loving, most privacy-adoring uh, person together. So next up, Ben Habib. Um, my name is Ben Habib. I'm a candidate for Reform UK. An interesting fact about myself is, well, uh, <laughs> I love boxing. I used to box at my university. Perhaps people don't know that. But uh, it's as interesting as it gets. <laughs> okay, no, <laughs> people will work through We've that. We've had two waves of inflation in this country. We talk about the waves of inflation that's happened in the last couple of years. But actually before that, when the banks collapsed in 2008, 2009, we printed money like video to save the banks. And that devalued the pound in people's back pockets. So it took the working and middle classes out of the ability to afford houses, which was put beyond their reach. So we had asset price inflation originally, which has damaged people's ability to aspire, to, to use their savings for any meaningful purpose. That seems to have been lost in most debates. Then of course we have what happened when we unlocked, which is a spike in com uh, consumer price uh, uh, inflation. And that's the most obvious one, because people now are suffering not only the inability to buy houses that they need to buy, but also simply to buy the food and heat their homes in the way that they need to do it. So that's what's wrong according to you? But that's what's you wrong. So what we have to do, Jen is absolutely right, what we have to do is grow the economy. But you do not grow the economy by taxing people to hell and preventing wages from rising. What we've got to do is cut taxes on the working and middle classes, our signature policy for Reform UK is to, to increase the threshold at which income tax is levied from £12,500 per annum to £20,000 per annum. That would take 6 million people out of the tax net. People are highly overtaxed. And the other really critical thing that we've got to do is pair back on this inexorable drive to net zero by 2050, which is burdening people's pockets incredibly. You do not, make the, you do not save the environment by bankrupting the economy. And then lastly, what we've got to do is cut back on legal immigration, which is undercut. We'll come on cheap, to that. Yeah, we will, but it's important for the cost of living crisis. Cheap imported labor has made it impossible for the domestic labor market to increase its wages. So it's a combination of inability to increase yeah. wages, overtaxation, and over costly regulations. Okay, you've managed to get a lot in there in that one answer. Ben Habib, you've just been on the hustings with BBC Northampton. Um, just tell us now, what, what, how do you think this is going? It's kicked off. You've been campaigning here for a while. What are people saying to you on the doorsteps? Well, I mean, a couple of things. So what is remarkable is how well-known Reform UK is now. You know, a few months ago, I was helping my fellow candidates in Mid Bedfordshire and, and Tamworth, and Reform UK wasn't known. The big criticism was people don't know who you are. But actually, we've had no real problem with that here. When we've driven around in our bus or we've been on the streets, I've had lots of thumbs up. I've had the odd bird as well, but suggests even our detractors know who we are. Um, and that's a good thing. So I think, you know, we're, our, the, the recognition is getting out there. And the other thing that's interesting is that obviously a lot of people are apathetic, irritated with politics altogether, but there's an anger developing. I feel an anger in people a bit like it was in 2016 and again in 2019 when Brexit was happening and then when Brexit wasn't delivered. And I feel an anger stirring in people. And you've seen that in the polls for Reform UK, haven't you? Going from 5% to now 13%, I think we polled recently. And um, 
and that's manifested on the streets here. So, I mean, how, how people vote on the day will obviously depend on how many people come out, but it's going to be an interesting by-election. Well, we'll come back to that, and we'll be following over the next couple of weeks with you. We'll be here at Together. We're going to be having a van out. We're going to encourage people to come out and vote, and we're going to say to people they should ask candidates rigorously about net zero. You talked about net zero. They should ask them about freedom yeah. and liberties. I want to say that like, Helen, the candidate from the Conservatives, did talk about the fact that blaming Brexit was the wrong thing. But you've said that people are angry, but also that they may be apathetic. Do you think that a positive... Some are apathetic and some are angry. Positive, you could, do you think you could... Ha what do you think your chances are here, Ben? I suppose is one question. From an electoral point of view, what's your goal here? Yeah. What are you aiming to do? So I'm, I'm aiming to win. The yeah. political sands are shifting and they're shifting fast and the polls can't keep up with political shifts right. when they happen like they're happening at the moment, which is self-evident when you look at what's happening to Reform UK's polling. So I'm aiming to win. The, as much as I like Helen, the Tories have, have taken this country to the precipice of utter disaster. In Suella Braverman's own words, we're facing an existential threat. And she was referring to immigration, but economically, politically, constitutionally, we saw the DUP sign up a deal that embeds the, uh, the Irish Sea border yesterday. This country is up against it. And if you keep voting for the same two parties, you're going to get the same result. I mean, none of the candidates this morning, including Helen, understand or certainly Helen didn't say, that she understood the damaging impact of net zero on people's back pockets, on the economy, our ability to thrive, the ability for the NHS to thrive. You know, if you take the economy down, crime's going to go up. NHS waiting lists are going to go up. Town centres will be incapable of being refurbished. Of course, that's self-evident, isn't it, to a sane-minded individual. But that argument isn't being made. Everyone kind of just buys this thing that, there's a climate emergency and we must emasculate ourselves, uh, sacrifice ourselves on the altar of net zero. As if getting to some magical figure of carbon emissions by 2050 is going to be the answer, if we ever get there. So, I mean, that, well, there'll be music to a lot of people at Together's ears, what you're saying. And obviously we've got members and signatories in Wellingborough as well as around the country. And there's a lot happening. And I think people like with Uxbridge will be looking at Wellingborough to see what happens as well as some of the May elections. So it's very important nationally. Um, there's some independents in here as well uh, that have made the point, interestingly to me, one of them made the point about this climate emergency, this climate crisis. As you said, town centres, city centres, uh, we're in this lovely place, the ugly mug, hospitality. All of this has yeah. been uh, really impacted in the last three years and with some of these measures. How much do you think uh, what because in the end, you are with reform. It's not just Ben Habib, right? And there are other independents. There are people locally. What do you think uh, the positive case, how much is what you're standing for, also what everything reform standing for, what would you make as the case for reform more broadly versus those that want to go independent and others that are undecided? I, I mean, reform. Um, reform is very simple. Reform stands for making policies for the British national interest, for British people's national interest. That is, it sounds daft to say that. You'd think all uh, political parties would do that, but they don't. You know, this, this net zero um, drive to, you know, by net 50, that's, that's an important global policy. Um, we saw Rishi Sunak go to COP28, splash out 1.8 billion on environmental issues in India when he went and described himself as the son-in-law of India, splashed out 1.6 billion. And where did that money come from? We're told we can't have tax cuts, that we can't uh, allow the working class to keep some of their legitimate earnings. No wonder the labor market's broken. If you can't keep what you earn, you're not going to be minded to work. That's the biggest deterrent to work that there is. It's got to pay to work. And that comes back to overburdensome regulations, net zero. In London, which, you know, which is where I know you're from, you know, ULES, congestion charge, low traffic neighborhoods, um, all of this is utter garbage. And of course, behind all of this, I don't know how much time we got, Alan, but behind all of this is the, are the pernicious regulations penalizing, for example, producers of gas boilers and heat exchangers if they don't sell a ever increasing proportion of heat exchangers alongside their gas boilers. And of course, those penalties will come back to the people. Highly damaging again and regressive taxation for the working and middle class. The same for internal combustion engines. If you don't, if, if, if manufacturers and wholesalers of internal combustion engines and electric cars don't sell an ever increasing proportion of electric cars, they get penalized. And of course, they'll pass those penalties on 
to everyone. The whole population is creaking under net zero. By the Treasury's own estimates, it's going to cost one and a half trillion pounds to get there. And when was the Treasury ever underestimating a cost? You know. Uh, we're, OK, so these are really important points. Uh, we're going to be following you around a little bit today. We're going to see you out on the street and on some doors, but we're going to come to the office as well. We're a former there. Uh, we're going to be I'm going to be asking you some more questions, maybe some uncomfortable questions. But I know you're robust and you're not a snowflake and you're happy to have that democratic discussion. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing some more. And everyone at Together, what we're saying here is that people should come out and vote. You should put each candidate under pressure, ask them questions, speak to Ben Habib, speak to the others. Make your minds up about who's the most freedom loving liberty loving wealth creating person that would be best for us welcome here to together talks podcast so i'm here at the hind in wellingborough very famously the hind welcomed both charles the first and oliver cromwell uh i know where i stood on that battle and i'm very excited about democracy and parliamentarianism and freedom however uh it seems that we've got a lot of problems with these issues today. And that's why it's really exciting to be in Wellingborough. I'm here with Ben Habib. Uh, and Ben is standing uh, as a reform candidate uh, in Wellingborough. There's around 80,000 constituents. And we're going to talk a bit more. And we're also going to follow you around, Ben, a bit and be here over a couple of weeks because it's a really important by-election, isn't it? This is a big one. I think more important than what happened in Uxbridge. How do you see it? Well, well, first of all, thank you very much, Alan, for taking the trouble of coming up and visiting me here. I think it is a very important by-election. Uxbridge was important because it was the first time that the lunacy of uh, the climate emergency being used to tax working and middle class people was brought to the fore. Um, you know, one doesn't really have to get into the whole debate over climate change to know that what they were doing with ULOs what they are doing with ULEZ, what they've done with congestion charge and so on, is driving London's economy into trouble. And so Uxbridge was a litmus test, I think, for that agenda. What Wellingborough is, is a litmus test for whether or not there's appetite in this country to vote genuinely for change. Because as we all know, and I hope viewers ha have surmised already, that if you vote Conservative, what you get is effectively Labour policies. And if you vote Labour, you get Labour policies. They're two sides of the same coin. Both of them um, believe in borrowing a lot of money, uh, taxing people to the hilt, redistributing wealth rather than creating it, um, dulling, du dumbing down, infantilizing the population so that aspiration is driven out of us and dependency has become, you know, the, the, the thing that they advocate for, uh, essentially. And we can see that. I'm kind of jumping ahead. You're getting an essay answer. But, you know, you see that in all the numbers we've got. GDP is, our, our economy is not growing. It's GDP is stagnant. But we've got 6 million people on universal credit to a greater or less extent, rampant immigration. All these things are symptomatic of policies of a, uh, a, 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 of a tax, borrow and spend government where people are paid effectively to stay at home and you're not paid if you go to work. So I'm going to drill down on a few things that I think uh, Together viewers in particular will be very interested in. And we've got together signatures and members and broader supporters in Wellingborough, uh, as well as across the country. Um, like a few things. You talk about the net zero things. That's something that we've got a big campaign about. Firstly, to have transparency about uh, what's actually going on. What does it mean, net zero? We've got these abstract ideas, but yeah. how does it impact us, cost and that type of thing? Uh, and... And also about what we've seen in the last few years, people talk about quite rightly the cost of living crisis. Some call it a cost of lockdown crisis. But how do you see, and let's start with this, the ability for Britain, how would you like to see productivity, wealth creation, solving some of these issues? It might be better for some people to be on welfare because they're not earning enough money. How do these things get resolved? Is this something that you've got very clear ideas about? What are they? Yeah, so at the heart of putting right all that's gone wrong is that our government must recognize, our, the, whichever government we have, must recognize that they have to make policies with British people's interest in, at heart. And I mean British people, not people from abroad. We have no obligations to foreigners. We are the United Kingdom. As a governing, uh, as a governing body, our obligation starts and ends with the United Kingdom. Yes, once we've looked after our own we may wish to help others, but that's, we are not obliged to others. And that has to be understood. 
um, there seems to be an acceptance, a belief in government that the greater global good will eventually be better for the United Kingdom. But it won't, because what, what we end up doing is making policies that are blind to national interests, that are blind to what would promote our, 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 our people's our welfare, eco economic interests, prosperity, and so on. Uh, the way I see it is that we've got to, in essence, got to be proud of who we are. We've got to stop trashing our history. We've got to stop talking of our forefathers as slave traders, but actually of people who abolished the slave trade and then spent a considerable amount of money as well as uh, sacrificing lives, policing the high seas, preventing the slave trade. We've got to stop this nonsense about decolonizing the English language and undermining the belief that we have in ourselves as a result of the hijacking of our language. We've got to champion our national heroes. And if we can develop that self-confidence in who we are, and we don't take the knee to these kind of globalist um, dumbing down attacks on the United Kingdom, we can start doing what's right for the economy. But of course, if you don't believe in the nation state that is the United Kingdom, which is where I think our governing class comes from, because they take their lead from the global stage, then you don't care about immigration either. And if you don't care about immigration, what you get is the rampant numbers of people that we've had coming into the country, as we have done over the last 25 years, um, putting huge burden on our economy, preventing people from being able to up their wages because they've been constantly undercut by imported cheap labor. Um, huge demands on our public services, NHS, education, housing, to name but three of them where we've got problems, uh, you know, massive problems at the moment, but also tearing at the social fabric of the country. Um, immigration, the way we've practiced it, hasn't been done uh, in an integrated manner where you take on board values of other people over a protracted period and slowly so you can kind of integrate harm harmoniously and homogenize and go forward as a stronger society. The way we've done immigration is through multiculturalism. And that's been deeply damaging. So how would I do it? I would cut taxes on the working and middle class. I'd make it pay for them to go to work. I'd cut back immigration dramatically so that wages rise in the UK. Yes, wages rise. Mm. You know, how is that a bad thing? Um, uh, let wages rise, cut back tax. If you have those two components, people can suddenly keep more money that they earn. And if they can keep more money that they earn, they're more motivated to go out and work. And they get up every morning and they feel aspirational because they can go out and have successes, which they're allowed to garner and keep for themselves and for their progeny. Okay, so you said a lot of things there, Ben, and now yeah. I'm going to drill down a little bit more because particularly our viewers are going to be interested in a few key things. These last few years is what gave rise to Together actually forming. Yeah. We saw egregious attacks on our freedoms, our liberties of privacy. Uh, some people will say, perhaps some people in reform will say, well, reform is actually just like the Conservatives used to be, or is it Tory light? Others uh, will say, well, I like Ben Habib maybe, but what about reform more generally? People have questions on many things, everything from the vaccine mandate to other points. From the points of views of freedom and on lockdowns and on questions around liberty, we hear your points on net zero, hear your points on immigration, on democracy and what's new. How is this not, and tell me, I want to hear from you, not a continuation of what we see in Westminster. The similar people that went to similar schools that all do similar things. They happen to like going to Davos and that type of thing rather than like Keir Starmer prefers Davos to Westminster, it sounds like. But how is this different? What is new about this? Or do we need something that's different? How, how do you see that? What would you say to people? Okay, so um, I was very reluctant. This is a personal response. I was very reluctant to get into a political party. I didn't want to be part of a political party for fear of my own views and beliefs having to be dumbed down, towing the line for a greater kind of policy agenda. Um, and Richard and I were talking for a number of years. I was part of the Brexit party for that momentary period to try and get, try and get Brexit over the line. We can have a whole discussion on Brexit if yeah. you like. Um, but then I took a step back from the Brexit party, which then became reform. And I was campaigning for various issues, which I believed in. Um, which again, we can talk about if you like. But then I, I, I realized towards the end of 2022 that 
Um, the country really is in deep crisis. You know, I think we go around, we, we live our lives in the belief that the UK will bounce back, that there's always been complaints about the NHS, that we're always complaining about people living on benefits, we're always complaining about too much tax, and somehow we keep surviving. And I don't think that presumption holds true anymore. I think the UK is genuinely facing an existential threat. Indeed, I think Western democracies are facing an existential threat for the kind of reasons that we might, in my opening comments that I made. You know, the problems that infect our political and governing class are problems that affect, infect the United States and, and most of Europe, all of Europe, with the exception of perhaps a few sensible countries. And, um, and so I joined party politics because I recognized that the only way to genuinely make an impact on politics is at the ballot box. Ultimately, you've got to stand up and be counted. You can do it through campaigning, but then what you're trying to achieve through campaigning is turning the minds of those who are already corrupted. And you're trying to get them to do the right thing. You're perpetually on a conveyor belt. It's like being on an escalator trying to go up when, the conveyor, when it's going down against you. You can't get there because those, those people who are in parliament stand, in my view, at the moment and have done for a number of years in opposition to the national interest, in opposition to the people of this country. So you've got to get them out. You can't just act as a weather vane to try and per persuade them to do the right thing. And when I eventually joined Richard Tice, um, Richard Tice's party, uh, Reform UK, I did it on one undertaking from Richard, which is that we would stand in every seat in, the, in Great Britain, we thought not Northern Ireland because there are no Conservative and Labour candidates standing in Northern Ireland and it's the two party system that we wish to attack and that we would not stand down against any Tories and we would not do deals with any Tories. We have to offer a genuine option for change. The Conservative Party has hoodwinked the public for decades claiming that they are small c Conservative believe in all the kinds of things I open this conversation with, and then delivering socialist labor type policies. And they've killed aspiration, they've introduced dependency, they've killed wealth creation, it's become all about wealth redistribution, immigration is rampant, they're embedding at a speed. Well, look, can I knots. interrupt? I agree. I agree. I think many people, and I'm going to have a coffee whilst we talk about this. Yeah. I think many Sorry, I, I'm not, no, I hope no, I'm no, not no, being no, too it's, repetitive. It's good. No, but, you're, yeah. People may well agree with you, Ben, but my question to you is, how is what you're doing new? You make a point about campaigning and it will fall on a lot of ears that, that are cynical and apathetic. You said apathy when I spoke to you earlier, which we're going to cut to in a while to show uh, yeah. the hustings. I don't think it's apathy as much. I think people don't feel they have control and autonomy over their uh, future and their situation. So they think that they're very cynical and distrustful about politicians. And often they're not so much about you as an individual. But the point still arises, you know, you make all these points about those that are in power at the moment corrupting. And we, I happen to think, and we together, many of us think that there's technocrats are all a blancmange and that's a big problem. But how is it not then, if I play devil's advocate, a few smart people in reform saying, well, just vote for us, we'll do it. What about all the issues that we've seen in the civil service? What about the capture of all our institutions? What about DEI, uh, uh, diversity, equality, inclusion? What about ESG, these things that are dominating in banking and privacy, across the board? And we will need to come on to what happened with Brexit a little bit and the Conservatives, and I get it in the spirit, like deals being done, but how are people going to have a confidence that, Ben Habib, but also maybe reform, are not going to be just like the others. How is it different and distinctive? Uh, that's what people are going to be asking. Because a lot of people to us say, well, what about all these different uh, independent parties? Maybe everyone should unite. We should have a coalition. Or, And I know this is, this is a second question. It would make one think when people are so cynical and disenchanted with politics that almost anyone should be able to get in that's challenging it. So I want to know, if you come on to that second, why that isn't happening yeah. at the moment. So in terms of why is Reform UK different, um, I don't need to be here. I've got a perfectly 
sensible, yeah. remunerative life outside politics. I'm only here because I genuinely think the country is in deep, deep trouble. Yeah. Um, I got triggered by the inability of the political class to deliver the people's mandate for Brexit. And then I, as you get more involved in politics, and I'm sure you've been on this journey, Alan, as you get more involved in politics and the mist lifts and you see how much damage these people are doing, how much they hoodwink you, you get more and more triggered. And once you're triggered, in that way, it's very hard to then put the blinkers back down and go back to normal life. So I'm here because I am compelled to be here. I am duty bound to be here. Mm -hmm. I'm not a career politician. Uh, what I would like more than anything on the planet is for the Conservative Party or some party, any party, to do what I think needs to be done and put me out of business mm -hmm. so I can go back to my normal life. And I think most people in Reform UK come at it because of that reason. We're not at it because we wish to be uh, politicians that make a career out of it and then decide what policies we have and what we might do for the country. We're at it because we genuinely think the country is facing massive threat. Mm. And we've got to avert that threat. When that avert, if that threat, if and when that threat is averted, you will see me retreat. I'll be gone. Is that being communicated, do you think, to the constituents in Wellingborough? How, how are people listening to your message? How are they engaging and responding with that? What, what's your take on what the lay, lay, lay of the land is here? Well, I've, the way I've been fighting my campaign is on, on the streets meeting people. That's not the most productive way to have a conversation. So I've been having a series of meetings with constituents who wish to come and meet me. So I've had two or three in Wellingborough. I've got one in Chelveston tomorrow, and then I've got another one in Rushton on Saturday with Anne Whittacombe, and I'm doing as many of these as I possibly can. And what I tell these people is my view of the world, which is that we're being run with this kind of globalist set of policies um, that need to be reversed, that the country is over-regulated, over-taxed, and is being socially torn apart through rampant immigration, and that we face economic, political, and constitutional implosion um, if, if, if we don't get a grip of this. And people understand it, they get it, they feel it, they can see it on the streets. We see it manifested in our public services that are all broken, crime out of control, the smell of weed every 15 yards as you walk down the street, the derelict shops, the offices that aren't occupied. People, see, there's a visual impression of broken Britain. So people understand what I'm saying. And what I think is changing quite dramatically is that recognition and the, and I think that recognition also amongst the people that they have to vote for change if they want it, that they can't just go on voting for the same old monkeys. Okay, and a lot of people you know. are not coming out to vote as well. So we see that people sometimes yeah. we don't even get 50% in some constituencies, yeah. local elections between 10 and 20. My question, I'm gonna push you further on this now because yeah. I agree and we all agree that this is critical in Britain and people are talking about watershed moments and precipices, but there is a sense in which it's dangerous as well when the democratic arena just seems like it's just for, look, why would people engage with it, right? That's yeah. dangerous. Uh, so the question is, right, let me just track back a little bit. Um, obviously, Nigel Farage is very famous, very well known, you know, he dedicated his life to a very particular thing, Brexit, it's loved by many because of it, despised by others because of it. And we've only just seen yesterday uh, Mr. Osborne's evening standard talking about a new thing that Brexit, many people don't want it, we go back, the rejoining moment, whether, and advocating for that, interestingly. And even as you've talked about, even if it's not formally done, you can see it informally being it's done. It's already with happening. happening. Yeah. Now, the question is, some things were done at the time, right? So Nigel and Richard, when it was the Brexit party, there, there was a deal that was done with the Tories. It's very public. Nigel now says well, it was a mistake potentially. And uh, not, not, it was a mistake. Uh, I think some people had a lot of sour grapes about that, particularly what we then saw happening. The point you're making about the similarity between those Conservatives and Labour and everyone championing more lockdowns, restrictions, Boris citing uh, the, the, the great liberals of the past and, and the Romans and the Greeks, but yet imposing uh, vaccine passes. We had that Liberal situation, policies. right? And now the reform is the next step from what Brexit party was and has a similar organizational structure how is it how is it if reform let, let me just make just, one just, yeah, the minute reform, did it not this is the point yeah 
the democratic spirit, the democratic quotient, and then a deal was done. Yeah. What about all the people on the I grounds? Was... What about all of that? Brexit and what it meant and now what we're seeing happening. Why yeah. should people trust reform now? And are you going to have an impact on all of that? What does that all mean for people? Yeah, I mean, just for, I can only, like, let me just say this. If Reform UK becomes some form of surrogate for the Tory party, mm -hmm. and I sense that that's what it is or is becoming, I will be off in, before you can say Robert's my father's brother, I will be gone and I will be blowing it from the rooftops that Reform UK is a Trojan horse and should not be backed. Um, re reform, I hope, will stay true to its ideal, which is to reform the United Kingdom and to return policy making and laws to the United Kingdom made for the United Kingdom's best interests. That's what I hope it is. That's what Brexit was. Brexit, by the way, people keep saying Brexit's not working. Brexit cannot fail. Brexit is simply the United Kingdom taking its rightful default position with 167 other countries out of 195 in the world that are not a member of the EU. Um, we do not need to be a member of the EU for us to have a bright future. The, 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 I mean, we should be turning it on its head and saying to Remainers and Rejoiners, make the case to join the EU, because the default position is the United Kingdom being on its own. That's what we are. This, the social, political and constitutional construct that is the United Kingdom came about over thousands of years. Mm. The EU is a political experiment that's existed for a couple of decades and ain't going so well, Yeah, you know. So and people can see that. And in fact, Helen, the uh, Conservative candidate, was making the point that Britain's doing better than some of our neighbours. And look at what's Much happening better in than Germany. Germany. Much and better was... than Germany. And so here's the other thing that some people will say. They'll say, well, they are deadly serious about this election, uh, both here in Wellingborough and across the country. And they want to not have certain people in power. And that whilst they really might like Ben Habib or reform, what's the prospect of... Uh, uh, of that being a reality when people are so wedded to either still the Conservatives and Labour, even though many are politically homeless. I think I can watch, win this. I think I can win this seat. And this country's election coming up nationally as well. Just yeah. what would you say to people about well, One step at a time. Yes. If I win this seat, uh, let's talk about winning. I think even if I put Conservatives into third place by coming second, um, I think that'll be politically seismic. But if I win this seat, Alan, you will see a political tsunami go across Westminster. Yeah. They will be in utter shock that someone who's never held a parliamentary position before has joined a new party that's only three or four years old mm -hmm. and has come into parliament. It'll tell them that the first past the post system that has protected the Conservative and Labour parties is no longer protecting them and that the people are up and they are voting. It'll be seismic. It'll be seismic for that reason. It'll also be seismic because when I first speak, there's a protocol in Parliament that your first speech is actually quite tame and you get up and you thank everyone, you do all the niceties. Mine will not be tame. I will get up and I will tell the Conservative Party, the governing party and the opposition why I'm there. It's because they have failed this country repeatedly, that they offer no bright future for this country, that they are, they have taken collectively, both of them have taken this country to the precipice and we are either about to fall over, I hope we haven't already fallen over. I will sock it to the two main parties every day that I go to the Commons in a way that they haven't experienced. Not with the timidity of a party political animal, but with the robustness of a Genghis Khan. That is what I, I intend to do if I get returned. So if I win this seat, it'll be massive for the political landscape in the United Kingdom. If I come second, it'll send a shockwave. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather win than send a shockwave. I'd rather have a tsunami than have a shockwave. Um, if I win this seat, then all bets are off as far as the two main parties are concerned. We can, we can make an impact at the general election. I get that. I want to ask you some specifics. You want to have control of the borders. Yeah. It, well, it's not, this particular issue isn't a, the one for, for together, but we do have an issue around things like digital ID cards, surveillance, yeah. uh, constant state. 
So it's a bit like free speech. A lot of people on our side, some people will say they're for free speech until it's something they don't like hearing. And then sometimes they're not for that. And we are unequivocally for free speech in a free society. Similarly, we're opposed to draconian measures of restrictions for our citizens, even when, and it's interesting now, it's being dangled around the question of migration. So where do you stand on compulsory digital IDs and surveillance by the state, even for an issue like migration, which you're really clearly so passionate about? Yeah, so I'm completely against uh, central bank digital currencies. I see them as positively evil. You know, central bank, that's, people confuse it often with cryptocurrencies. It's the antithesis of cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies is, you know, you own some kind of notional asset, which no one can really track down because it's yours, it's held, it's yours privately. Central bank digital currencies, basically the pound note that you, Alan, own, is, I'm sure you know all this, Alan, um, but you know, for those who are watching, uh, the power note that you own will be registered at the Bank of England as being Allen's. And when you spend it, they will know exactly what you spent it on. Yeah. And um, that is total state control. And we've got to stop it. We're already moving away from a cashless society, which is very damaging, I think, to freedom. The fact that we can't spend our money without it going through a system that can be audited and, uh, you know, decisions can be made based on how they see our spending habits um, and what we do. Um, so totally against all of that, IDs, etc., against the mandatory vaccination. It wasn't a vaccine. At best, it was some kind of prophylactic. It wasn't a vaccine. It didn't protect in the way they said it would protect. Totally against lockdowns. Boris Johnson used to liken lockdowns to World War II, that, uh, the fighting COVID to World War II. It's the antithesis of World War II. In World War II, people gave up their lives to save their civil liberties. In, in COVID, we gave up our civil liberties to save our lives. That's the transition this country's been through. We would have, we've given up Northern Ireland. Well, one of the reasons I've stayed in politics is to protect the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We've given up 1.8 million people across the IRC, British citizens, to a foreign power, subject to foreign laws made by a foreign legislation, enforced by a foreign court, without a single shot being fired. Yeah, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't have digital IDs Sorry, around, moved the on, issue, but, you know. around the issue of migration is, I think, what you're saying as well. You wouldn't allow them to be imposed on the basis... No. no right, OK. Yeah. So, we should know who's in our look, country another, without having yes. for everyone carrying an ID card. Got it. Thank you. And another thing that came up recently, I mean, I'm not going to try and hold you accountable for things other people have said, but yeah. I, was, I happened to be on a panel with Richard and there was a discussion about uh, the, the banning of certain marches or flags and things yeah. like that. And I happen to think that's quite dangerous, even yeah. if I find some of the I ideas agree with reprehensible. You. I think it's very dangerous. What we have to do is, we've got two problems. So we were talking about the Palestinian marches, presumably. Um, we've got two issues with this rampant mi migration that's taking place in the UK. The first is to stop it, to halt it, and you know, dramatically reduce it. I think that's pretty, we're very clear, Reform UK is very clear on that. What people aren't talking about so much is the second leg of the issue that we've got to get on with, and that is multiculturalism has to stop operating as multiculturalism. We have to integrate. Mm -hmm. We have to integrate as a society. That doesn't mean we all have to believe the same things. We can have diversity of thought, but we've got to have inclusion when it comes to our societal norms. And the settled social construct that I mentioned that's taken thousands of years to create in the United Kingdom, that's got to be harmonious and relatively homogenous. There's got to be positive attempts and efforts made to integrate. We've got to get on with it uh, urgently. What we don't do is shut down multiculturalism through policing, by diktat, by preventing the Palestinian marches. What we do do is bring those people into British values, make them see the error of their hostile rhetoric and ways and their desire to wipe out Israel. and get to a, a more settled sort of uh, a settled country in the way that we used to be. When I grew up, I'm going to cut, you asked me about DEI earlier, uh, which is part of this, by the way, diversity, equality, and inclusion, what we see on the streets, two-tier policing, all of this, they're all part of the same issue. Um, when I grew up, it was very, very clear, and I'm sure you'll remember this because we're a similar age, we were told everyone is equal. We were never told that if you're of Pakistani ethnic origin or North African ethnic origin, you should be given special treatment, that your culture should be respected more than British culture is, that you should be given a right to a job 
just because you happen to be from an ethnic minority. Now we have regulations through diversity, equality and inclusion, the Equalities Act, listing rules from the stock exchange and so on that require boards of directors to be multi-ethnic, that require uh, the armed forces to dumb down their ability to defend the country in the pursuit of having a multi-ethnic fighting force. Um, we've got to do away with, DEI needs to be abolished. We talk about woke. Woke is not a social, uh, woke hasn't just turned up as a fad. Woke has been regulated and legislated into place. It's been put there by our governing classes. It's in acts of parliament. It's in regulations that govern us. So when you asked me earlier, some time ago, how would you get rid of it? I, I know precisely where we need to go to unpick the regulatory and legal framework that has instituted woke that has instituted diversity and equality and inclusion, and that has prevented us from being able to have the kind of peaceful marches that we would like to see on our streets. Okay, good answer. So um, I'm gonna, a couple of questions, then we're gonna come out on the street with you, because we've done some shooting earlier with you with the BBC, asked us to stop filming. Obviously we will pay for the BBC. Uh, I think it was a great hustings and, and nice on the radio, but it is interesting that they, you know, people get, slightly petrified where we're from. I think they thought we were going to do some kind of intervention, a bit like Just Stop Oil. We're very different to that. But we are very passionate in making sure that everyone gets to uh, hear and engage. And we want the public involved as much as possible. Uh, and that's why we're doing this as well, because we think that everyone in Wellingborough uh, who is a supporter or a fan of Together should come out and vote. You should ask Ben and the other candidates where they stand on the net zero pledge that we've got, right? Yeah. We've got a pledge on net zero. He talks, Ben talks very passionately about his criticisms of net zero and the other issues and you should come out and vote you should do that right it's really important we're going to be encouraging people to do that uh, and also to get involved but a couple of quick final questions till we go out Ben one thing that's come up is that <laughs> people are saying we should have uh, you know get ready for war and national conscription on the very basis of what you've been talking about people our gatekeepers the people who run our institutions our leaders do not believe in the British values, they can't even say what they were, of the enlightenment, of liberty and freedom. We've seen that in the last few years. The idea that you get someone to sign up and fight and die for something where people don't even know what they are seems ludicrous to me. But also there's a concern that there's a bit of tub thumping at the same time. It might seem like a contradiction. It's not the old Kitchener, your country needs you. But there's a danger with gobby mouthing and just loosely asserting things on international geopolitical issues, right? That everyone starts shaking their shoulders. And all of a sudden, we don't have the smart geopolitical realpolitik of interest. What we have is a kind of adolescent, like virtue signaling. And that's dangerous. I think we've been in the virtue signaling adolescent foreign policy making for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. Um, we should never have had the Iraq war. We should never have gone to war in Iraq. There was no justification for it. The 22 year occupation of Afghanistan yielded absolutely nothing of geopolitical importance, mm. with the exception perhaps of killing Osama bin Laden, which could have been more effectively done with a drone and some special intelligence. Um, North Africa, stirred up by the Arab Spring, ideological adolescent nonsense. David Cameron and Obama decided that they were going to democratize the North Africa, the democratized North Africa and the Middle East at the end of a gun. That's what they decided. And they stirred up North Africa. They made Libya into a failed state. Yeah, sure, Gaddafi was a bad man, but it wasn't for us to go in there and absolutely destroy Libya. We virtually did the same thing to Egypt. We destroyed Syria, which was a peaceable country of 22 million people. Sure, we don't like Assad. Sure, he's a dictator, but he's not our problem. He was the Syrian people's leader. It was for them to sort their issues out. And we're doing the same thing in Ukraine. Don't make no mistake. The EU yanked Russia's tail repeatedly in an adolescent ideological manner, trying to turn Ukraine's head repeatedly economically towards the West. When Russia sees Ukraine as its backyard, sure, the Ukrainian people should be allowed to do what they wish to do, but we shouldn't be in there yanking people's tails. NATO flirting with Georgia, flirting with Ukraine. These are all bad adolescent foreign policies. And I'm, I'm glad you said the word adolescent because they are immature. We shouldn't be doing it. Well, it, you certainly uh, encouraged me with your answer. I'm not, should, is everyone, I, I is everyone say, in reform have the same position I wanna say, as you? I want to say one more thing. Didn't we just see a picture of, of the leader of reform in, in Ukraine? Ukraine? So I, can I, I'll come to that. Yes, can I just say one yes. more thing? I think this table thumping that's going on 
by political leaders and uh, leaders of the armed forces saying that we could have conscription, we're about to go to war, I think is, first of all, it's misguided, it's wrong. I don't think we are going to war. If anyone thinks what's happening in the Middle East is new, they need to go back and read some history books. Mm -hmm. It's been happening all my damn life. Yeah. What's happening in Ukraine is a particular issue for a particular reason and must not be conflated into anything bigger than that. However, and this is coming back to your question about Richard, however, we have now yanked the bear's tail. The bear is upset. The bear is in a corner. And by putting the bear in a corner, we forced him to sidle up to China and, and, and they've sidled up to Iran. And through this adolescent, ideologically driven, stupid foreign policy, we've create, we are creating problems for ourselves. We need to row back from it. We need to look at what we used to do in the 19th century. We were much more enlightened in the 19th century. We went abroad. We traded with people. We didn't export our views. We didn't export our ideology. We didn't try to democratize the subcontinent. What we did was trade with them. And through trade, they got richer and we got richer. That's what we should be doing abroad. Trade, not aid, not war. So on the, I want to come back to the final bit on Richard, but I also want to ask yeah. you because some people have said that you've mentioned conscription and I in the past have talked about how people doing stuff in the military could be of value. But then we've got the problem, haven't we, of the people that are running this country and, and the, the very things you've just said. So just from a point of clarification, where are you on the conscription thing? Well, I'm completely against conscription unless okay. we're in a world war. Yeah. You know, unless we're, the United Kingdom is being attacked. Yes. I, I, I see great benefit, by the way, from national service. Right. I can see great benefit bringing national service back. Okay. Bringing discipline to young... Explain the difference for people. So conscription is you're forced to sign up to a standing army. Yeah. Whereas national services, you transition, you freewheel through a standing army for a period of time, learn the, learn the skills, get trained, and then you're there as a potential uh, a member of the fighting force if we are threatened at a massive level. But I also think... But wouldn't they have all been sent to war in these examples you've just given if everyone had been through national service? And, and, and wouldn't that happen if we had a new uh, Iraq moment or a new... Wouldn't... Yeah, and, but we, what we've got to... What, sure. And, you know, the army serves our political leaders. And that's why our political leaders need to take their responsibilities very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be trying to democratize Iraq or democratize I Libya. I mean, look at Libya they now. They could try and democratize Britain a little bit more. They, could do, they could do a bit. <laughs> and look at, look, let's just talk about that for a second. So the man who was trying to democratize North Africa, the Arab Spring, promoted it, killed hundreds of thousands of people, by the way, David Cameron. That, yes. That, David Cameron and Obama, that initiative killed hundreds of thousands of people yes. in that locality, is now foreign secretary, yeah. not even a member of parliament. He skipped over the democracy which he holds so dear, yeah. and he's been promoted to the House of Lords, from which he holds forth without any checks and balances on him, telling us what we should be doing for our foreign policy. It's an anathema. That's why the Tory party has to be destroyed. Well, you're hearing it here. Ben's very clear on this issue. Um, I uh, just... Richard was in Ukraine. Just tell us why you think that is. And then, and then we're going to come on the street with you, if okay. that's all right. And we're going to come back and revisit this in a bit. So let me be clear on something else. Having yanked the bear's tail, yeah. if we end up in a war with Russia yeah. and China, I will be the first to sign up. Okay. Because I will put my country's interest first. Even though it's a war that we may have been able to avoid, mm -hmm. should have avoided, I will go and do what's right for the country. I'm probably too old for it, so they'll turn me away, but I will do what's right for the country. Richard was there, I think, on a humanitarian mission. Um, he was not there advocating for war against Russia. I don't want war with Russia. I want no war with anyone. We should avoid it like the plague, mm. but we should be bloody well ready for it. And we have diminished our armed forces mm. and we need to invest in them. It, 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 you know, we talk about the hijacking of the English language. One of the most pernicious forms of hijacking has been the peace dividend. Do you remember the peace dividend? It emerged in the late 80s after mm -hmm. the Berlin Wall fell. We can spend the peace dividend. What that meant was hollowing out our armed forces. We should never have done it. If you want peace, be prepared for war. Well, I think it's interesting that someone who uh, grew up boxing, uh, which is kind of a good thing. I like boxing. Anyone who's never been in the ring with someone or trained in boxing should get to know what it is. I'm almost, always really interested in politicians who talk about war who've often never been in a punch-up themselves. I mean, war is brutal and terrible and disgusting. And 
although there are ideas that I think we should be prepared to fight and die for. But um, diplomacy, and I think the thing is, what you've demonstrated for here, I sit with a lot of people and we argue a lot of things politically uh, in the last couple of years, we've been doing it up and down the country, is that, Ben, you've got a very, very clear and resolute set of ideas. You seem to be refreshing from the point of view of in a way that where other politicians don't want to be. I, I was stopped by Helen's uh, special advisor who intervened when I tried to talk to her and oh, said, really? come and speak yeah. to me. And I find that happens a lot now with these professional politicians. Um, but hopefully we'll get to speak to her and we'll speak to uh, the Labour and Lib Dem guys. We've not managed to see the Lib Dem councillor in uh, Bath come out for uh, over 350 days to talk to their constituents. There's a contempt, it seems. Just finally, tell us what you will do in Wellingborough. How will you be with constituents? Remind people why you think they should vote for you. From a local perspective or from the national? Do both, if you so, want. So uh, everyone tells me, Ben, you've got to fight the campaign on local issues. When the nation is facing an existential threat, I I'm afraid it is the national issues that are going to determine your fate. Mm -hmm. And Wellingborough is not alone as a constituency suffering in the various things it's suffering in. NHS not working properly, uh, centre of town, tired, derelict, retail units out of use, crime on the up, etc. These things are national, okay? So what I will do for Wellingborough is fight those national issues in the way that they need to be fought in order to prevent them from manifesting themselves locally. Okay. Now, the other thing that I find really interesting about the hustings, and I'm just talking, going really local, no one talked about Northamptonshire, a uh, North Northamptonshire District Council. That's the district council that runs the constituency together with Corby, Kettering and East uh, Northamptonshire. It was created three, three, four years ago. It was created because effectively, with the exception of the borough of, well, of Wellingborough, which was doing the, 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 the borough of Wellingborough, which was doing quite well, the others had more or less gone bust. It hasn't produced financial accounts, Alan, since it was created. Yet it has increased its council tax every year by the maximum possible amount. None of the candidates who all claim to be local brought that up this morning. The BBC didn't bring it up and none of the candidates brought it up. How can you improve the governance of your constituency if you don't know and you can't measure how the money is being spent in your constituency. So my first job locally will be to get to North Northamptonshire District Council and shake them until I get a set of accounts that I can interrogate, see where the money is going and make sure it is spent better for the people of Wellingborough. Well, you heard it there. And I think you should decide whether you'd want to have Ben Habib if you're in Wellingborough and you can vote. Uh, I certainly am uh, reassured by uh, the idea of a rational, balanced, but robust person that could be diplomatic, but also tough on key issues around freedoms and liberties. So I know myself where I stand. Uh, and together, we're putting it out to all of you in Wellingborough. Come out, get involved, vote. Um, one of the things we've seen that's happened in local constituencies, particularly, is the hijacking of uh, uh, local democracy through a few tiny green billionaires that have funded a load of fake grassroots organisations, not like Together, which is funded by you guys, by our members, but uh, we've seen Cohen and the likes of it, Bloomberg uh, uh, and Bill Gates underwriting things like UK 100, C40 Cities, who have, uh, uh, cycling campaigners, they have all gone to shut down our roads to impose limits and restrictions with surveillance. We're uh, saying that everyone needs to get involved, have their voices heard around that and the Net Zero Pledge. Make sure you go to these candidates and speak to them over these next couple of weeks. Remember, it's the 15th of this month, 15th of February, that the, the vote is. Uh, so make sure you ask the questions about freedom. You get involved. You get your friends and neighbours to come out and get involved. We'll be out. We'll be talking to Ben Moore on the street. And remember, we're better together. And in the end, even if you've got bright people that are standing, it's going to be down to us as the public to keep everyone honest and to hold everyone accountable and responsible. So let's do that together. Ben, Habib, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you.